So uh, today, we are going to be starting a brand new sermon series. Last week, can you believe it's already been a week? It feels like it's been like a month since Easter happened, right? Man, I don't know what it is, but there's just something going on. The world's getting busier and busier, I guess. But today, what we want to do is for the next three weeks, we are going to be covering some of the post-resurrection Uh, appearances of Jesus and how they impacted the early church and why they should still impact us today. We're calling this series Risen Indeed. Risen Indeed. And if you remember last week, we... um, when I was introducing the sermon last week, I mentioned that in the early church, when it was first starting out, the church was under a lot of persecution, and so the people would go up to one another to try to figure out, is this person safer not to talk to, or am I going to get in trouble for sharing Christ, and you know, are, am I going to be persecuted and arrested for being a Christian? What they would do is they would walk up to people and say, he is risen, and the appropriate response to that, if you were a fellow believer, was, he is risen indeed. And I told you the Greek for that, and, you know, hopefully uh, you can remember that. Should I try it? You guys ready? Oh, you guys are like, I don't remember any of this. <laughs> I don't, look, I do not uh, uh, have some sort of disillusion that you guys remember every single word of my sermon every week, all right? So I will let you off the hook. We're not going to go there today then, all right? Um, but that's where this sermon is coming from, is that we want to proclaim that, yes, he is risen indeed. On Easter, we proclaimed he is the risen Christ. He is the one that we worship. He is the only one who rose from the grave and now is seated at the right hand of the Father in power. And he sent the Holy Spirit. We're going to be talking about that later on this month, too. But for the next three weeks, we want to focus in on the importance of his resurrection appearances to his followers. So, today... Turn with me in your Bible, if you will, or if you don't have a Bible, there's a black one there in the pew back in front of you, and we're going to be reading from Luke's Gospel. This is what is known as the Road to Emmaus. Now, Emmaus was a city we don't really know where it necessarily is. All we are told that it was roughly seven miles uh, from Jerusalem, and on this encounter with Jesus, we're going to encounter two gentlemen uh, that just have an amazing uh, impact an amazing encounter with the resurrected Lord, and it is recorded by us, or for us rather, by Luke here in chapter 24. So hopefully you're there by now. Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. Again, if you grab one of those Pewback Bibles, it is page uh, 1051 in the Pewback Bible. And this is what the Word of God says today. That very day, two of them, two of the disciples, were going to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and, dis- and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women, and you know, when you read that, you, 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 you kind of got to hear this little bit of a sneer in their voice, some women, you know, you know how those women are. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he had even, they, had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he, he being Jesus, said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of hearts, to believe what the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things according, uh, concerning himself. Verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. 
He acted, he again being Jesus, he acted as if he was going farther. And they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, there it is, and has appeared to Simon. And they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, the Bible. God, thank you for the many amazing stories that it contains. And God, I pray that as we dig into these verses this morning, God, that you would quicken our hearts, God, that you would help us to have that joy and that excitement that the first disciples did, Lord, when you were resurrected and they started encountering you after the resurrection before you ascended to heaven. God, let our joy be complete as theirs was in these moments, Lord. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen and amen. Well, hey, thanks for hanging with me there, guys. I know it was a long scripture to read this morning, but we want to dig in today in the time that we have to this story about the road to Emmaus. Now, this is a story that is unique to Luke's gospel. None of the other gospel writers tell the story like this. And Luke is very well known for adding all these little extra details into his gospel that the other ones don't have. And he does this because, as he says at the beginning of the work of his gospel, of his telling of Jesus' life story, that he researched this, that he interviewed all these different people, and he pulled all the different stories together and put them into one place for us so that we could easily understand that Jesus was the Messiah. And so he has this story. The only other place that this is even slightly alluded to in the New Testament is in Mark. Mark's gospel gives it two verses, and it says this. After these things, he appeared, he being Jesus, in another form to two of them as they were walking into the countryside. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. This is the only other occurrence where this story is alluded to. However, the fact that Mark who was trying to get the word out quickly. He, was, he is the immediate gospel. If you remember my first sermon I ever preached, we preached about that. And, and he's the one that was like, I want to give it to you in as fast of a telling as I can so you can get the word out as fast as you can. And he, even Mark, said there was something about this story, about these two guys in the countryside, that was so important that even in the urgency of Mark, he paused for a moment and said, oh, by the way, there were two guys that encountered Jesus in the countryside also as they were walking along the road. And so we need to kind of sit up and take notice of this story today and realize the importance of it, not just in Luke's gospel, but to us in our lives today. So the first thing we want to ask ourselves is, who in the world are these guys? Like, why is it important, and, and why these two, and why does Jesus appear to them, and why does Luke include them? Well, a few things we know about these guys, all right, is, is from the text. First of all, they are disciples of Jesus. Jesus has resurrected from the dead. Luke immediately uh, puts this into his gospel right after there's kind of this cliffhanger moment in the verses preceding this in verse 12 where he says that the women had reported these things that Jesus was resurrected, but it was, it was kind of hard to believe them that it had actually happened. And then he immediately jumps into this story and he says two of them, so when he refers to them as two of them, he's referring to them as some of the disciples who heard the woman's report. Now, how long had they been disciples? We don't know. The story does not tell us. Some scholars believe that these were a couple of the guys that when Lazarus was raised from the dead and a bunch of people started believing in Jesus at that point, it was right before the Passover, right before what we know as Easter, they think that these guys, these two guys, may have been some of those bandwagon jumpers that you know, started following Jesus after Lazarus resurrected. I personally 
don't think that way. I think that these guys have been with Jesus for a while, that maybe they were part of the entourage, that whenever Jesus would come near Jerusalem, they would gather around and hear his teaching. I think that maybe they were at the feeding of the large crowd that Luke records in his gospel. And there's reasons for that that I'll explain later that I feel that way. But I think that these guys were a little bit well known than we give them credit for. I think there's a reason that Luke names one of them in this gospel because he was a well-known disciple. He may not have been one of the 11 that were left. He may not have been ones that had been called apostles later, but he was well-known enough that, that Luke references him and says, hey, go talk to Cleopas. You guys all know Cleopas. Go talk to him. He's going to tell you the same story that I'm recording here for you. So we know that they're disciples, all right? We, we know that they are slow to believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. And let's cut these guys just a little bit of slack, all right? Because if you and I were in the same situation, now look, we have the whole book compiled for us. We know what the story ends at, and we know how it ends. However, these guys were in the moment. They didn't know what was going on. They had heard that somebody had been resurrected from the dead. They'd never experienced something like that before. The only time they'd experienced it was when Jesus called forth Lazarus, and now there is no Jesus to call him forth. So how am I supposed to believe this? So they were a little bit slow on the uptake. They were leaving Jerusalem to go home because they were thinking, well, this is just craziness, and I don't know what to think about this. I have stuff I got to do. Now, again, us, we look at the story of Jesus' resurrection like, man, I wouldn't have left. I would have stayed there and tried to figure out what was going on. Look, these guys had lives they had to get back to. The Passover was over, and so now they were heading back just like they would every year on their pilgrimage. And so... Here we have these two guys who are returning to a place called Emmaus. Again, we don't know where Emmaus is. There is no place still in existence today called this. And different scholars have taken different guesses as to where this could be. Some, one of them says, um, you know, it could be actually 20 miles away, that maybe this was a typo in Luke's gospel. Look, if it says seven miles, I'm going to believe it's seven miles, all right? Just because the city doesn't exist today doesn't mean that it didn't exist then, and Again, we pick up the story, it's post-resurrection Sunday, and you have these guys, they've heard the report, so now it's probably mid-morning, they start on their journey. It takes me quite a while to walk seven miles. I don't know about you guys, but it, it would take several hours to walk seven miles with Jesus, and so it makes sense that if they're walking seven miles and they're starting at a, you know mid-morning, say 10 o'clock, after they hear the report of the ladies and they've wrestled with it for a little bit, that timeline works, all right? If it's 20 miles, they can't walk that far in one day and get there before sunset. It's just, it can't happen, all right? So, again, this is what we know about these guys. We know where they live, we know that they're followers of Jesus, and we know that they are well-known, at least to the people in Luke's time. So, what is at the crux of this story, then? Is it really all about these two guys? I'm going to say no, it goes so much beyond these two gentlemen, it, it speaks to the hearts of each and every person that's here, each and every one of you that's watching online today. This story is about us, and this story teaches us a lesson just like it was teaching these guys a lesson. So what is the lesson at the heart of this story? Well, if you ask me, I'm a very pragmatic person, all right? And so when I read this story, this is what I see. I see that this is a model of what does it look like to witness for Jesus, what does it look like to be a witness? Like, how should we go about doing that? What does evangelism, sharing the good news, look like? And what does Jesus want it to look like? Because let's be honest, guys, and I've mentioned this before, we are awesome here, especially in the American church, of coming up with systems and programs and scripts and all these different ways to share the gospel and to ask these questions and have these answers ready and things like this. And, and in the scripture, Jesus, in one of his very first resurrection appearances, kind of gives us a model of, hey, this is what it should look like when you're sharing about me. This is what it should look like when somebody is a little bit inquisitive about trying to understand this resurrection story. So how does Jesus do this? What is the model? What is kind of the means by which he lays out? Well, first of all, we notice that Jesus walks with them. He takes the time to go on this journey with them. This was something that is, is you know, if we were today, let's again put this in today's context. If you walked up to somebody today 
and you heard them talking about something that you had some knowledge about, how likely would you be to say, hey, you know what, let's take a seven-mile hike and discuss this? Any show of hands, you guys would do that? How many of you guys would say, hey, you know what, I will, you know, let's go grab a coffee, and I'm going to carve out, you know, eight hours of my day, six to eight hours of my day to have a discussion about this with you. We just don't do that these days. And Jesus is saying here, is, is he's taking the time to journey with them. They thought that he was just another traveler returning from Jerusalem. It, it says here in the text that he comes upon them. So what that means is that they're walking along and they're talking about this thing. And the word that is used for this discussion that they're having is actually a word in the Greek that means they were hotly debating this thing. So instead of thinking like, you know, they're walking along and they're like, I don't know, what do you think about this Jesus thing? I don't know, man. Mary and Mary, I think they're off the rockers. No, I don't think so. I think that maybe they have a point here. No, no, no. They're arguing. They're, oh, you're crazy. Why in the world would he do that? You know, he died. You can't come back from that. Nobody comes back from that. And, oh, but, but, but Mary, I know Mary. She's a, she's a, you know, a woman who knows her stuff. No, you're crazy, Cleopas. This is the kind of conversation that they're having. So anybody that walks up is going to hear these guys arguing. And if you've ever been around somebody that has a Jewish heritage, you know how heated Jewish arguments can get. And so here comes Jesus. He hears this argument happening. He walks up and he just kind of interrupts them and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? Kind of let me into this a little bit too. I want to get my blood pressure up a little bit and have a conversation with you guys. And so he comes up behind them and enters into their lives with the intent of going deeper and taking them deeper into this meaningful moment with them. There's no agenda here. There's no time frame on it. Jesus just comes up and he says, hey, explain this to me a little bit. So the first thing is he's willing to walk with them. The second thing that we see Jesus doing here, which I think we could all learn a little bit of a lesson from today, is first, he asks them some questions. He doesn't just launch into a diatribe. He doesn't start preaching at them. He doesn't go nuts with them and like, you know, hey guys, let me just set you straight here, okay? Hold on just a second. He comes up to them and he asks them, first of all, what are you guys talking about? And then he mentions it a little bit, and then, and then they, they give him a little bit of clarity, and then he goes a little bit further, and he says, okay, what things are you talking about then? And, and again, they're, they're, they can't believe he's coming from Jerusalem. How in the world does he not know that Jesus of Nazareth had been crucified? How does he not know that the tomb is empty? How does he not know? And so he asks them, what things? He's trying to establish where are they at? Where are they at with their own walk with me right now? I'm I'm coming alongside of them, but I want to understand them before I try to make them understand me. And here's the problem is that nowadays we end up in this situation where when you have a conversation, and, and no show of hands on this one, okay, because we're all guilty of this. When you have a conversation with folks, sometimes what ends up happening is that you are just waiting for them to stop talking so that you can give a response. You're not really trying to hear them. You're just waiting for them to stop talking so that you can interject what you want to say to them. Jesus doesn't do that here. He asks them, what are you talking about? Oh, explain that to me. Explain how you understand that. And then, yes, he's going to get into what he wants to say, But first, he allows them space to explain to him where they're at. When was the last time that you and I had a conversation where you took the time to let somebody else talk it out first? Didn't interject anything. You just said, hey, tell me about that. And just let them talk for as long as they needed to. And and especially if you were face-to-face with a verbal processor, which um, I know... Just from getting to know some of you guys here at the church, I know that we have some verbal processors here at the church, um, and, and I love you guys to death, but uh, man, y'all can talk, right? And I love you for it, and I, I'm one of those folks, too, that sometimes I just want to process something verbally, and I'm wrestling with it. Instead of doing it internally, I'm doing it out here, and I'm just, uh, 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 right? And so Jesus lets them do that, and he, he's gauging where they are, and then he says, I want to journey with you, but I don't want to just take a physical journey. 
I want to journey with you spiritually. I want to get you not just to a physical location. I want to get you to a location where you recognize what has happened here. I want to take you deeper. I want it to be more than just a physical journey. I want it to be a journey of understanding, a journey of enlightenment as to who the Messiah is. So how does Jesus take them on this journey? Does he hand them a book? Maybe he hands them the real God by Chip Ingram. I don't know. Maybe he hands them, you know, one of these New Believers books and says, here, read this and you'll be good to go. While we're walking along, I'll I'll make sure you guys don't trip on anything. You just read this book. He doesn't do that. He takes them to the scriptures. He takes them to the scriptures. He, He points them to the scriptures and then he allows them to wrestle with the text. He doesn't go into this long explanation and quote a bunch of scholars and and talk about, you know, how this guy feels this way and this guy feels this way, which, by the way, I love doing, but that's not what Jesus does. All he does is he says, hey, Moses and the prophets and all the wisdom books, they all point to Jesus as the Messiah. And here's how they do it. And he starts quoting things to them from the prophets. And we're not told what it is that he quotes. And I think there's a reason. I think that if we were told exactly what he quoted from the Old Testament, that we would turn that into a system. That we would be like, you know what, here you go, Isaiah 40, Isaiah 60, you know, John chapter, and and we would turn this into a system. But here's what I do know, is that when it comes to pointing them to the scriptures, we're not told specifically what he does here or where he points them. But if you read Luke's gospel in its entirety, there's almost this same journey where Luke is over and over again, he's quoting different Old Testament scriptures. He quotes from Isaiah, he quotes from the Psalms, he quotes from uh, Jeremiah, he quotes from the books of wisdom, he quotes, quotes from Proverbs, and he takes you on a journey, Luke does, as he's writing. And so if you want to know how do you connect Jesus to the Old Testament, it's almost like Luke here is saying, look, you've read the book already. You know all of these things point to him. Jesus is just reminding these guys of how it points to him. And I love their response to this. When they finally recognize him, they have this moment of awe where they say, didn't our hearts burn inside of us when he was talking to us? When he was opening up the scriptures, didn't something inside of our hearts ignite also? I love how this uh, little encounter here, the few things that the, the, the individuals say about Jesus, and again, we're not told what Jesus reveals to them, but it's, it's very similar to what Peter preaches on Pentecost Sunday. When the Holy Spirit comes down and Peter gets up and he tells the story, Luke here, he is, he's giving us like a prologue to the book of Acts because what you need to realize is that in the originals, Luke and Acts was one book. It was two volumes, but it was one book. He wrote it so that you could understand Jesus is the Messiah, and because Jesus is the Messiah, now this is how you should respond to him. That's what the book of Acts is about. And so this story, more than any other, in my opinion, is connecting the two books. And we see that in the story here on the road to Emmaus and then into the the sermon that Peter preaches on Pentecost. What do I mean? Well, what they do here is they say, we understand that we thought he was the Messiah. And then it says the scriptures point to the Messiah. That's what Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. And then he squarely, these two individuals squarely put the onus on the Jewish people for killing Jesus, which is exactly what Peter does on the day of Pentecost. He says, you heartless generation, you are stiff necks just like your fathers, and you killed the Messiah. And unless anti-Semitism comes up in our hearts, Peter and Jesus both, although the onus is there, They move on and say, but there is hope because of the Messiah. Peter says, repent and believe these things and be baptized. Jesus here breaks bread and says, I am the Messiah. And then he disappears from their sight. The Emmaus discussion underscores the point that the traumatic events surrounding Jesus are part of God's greater plan of deliverance. What they've seen is not the end of hope as they thought when they decided to leave the city. They said, hope is dead. we got to get out of here. What the road to Emmaus and what this story tells us is that 
what we thought was the end is really just the beginning. You see, we talked about this on Wednesday night uh, a couple of weeks ago, that a little too often we underestimate the power of the Bible. We think we need to explain it to everybody. We need to have all these different things in place for us. We need to know how to have this argument with people. We need to be able to explain the problem of evil. We need to be able to explain all these things. All Jesus did was gave them scripture, you guys. He said, here's the text. You wrestle with it. So many times we, we, we do more than we have to do. And sometimes all it really takes is just saying, hey, look. Here it is. You can, you can disagree with me all you want, but it doesn't change what's written. That's what Jesus is pointing to these two guys. And I love the Gospel of Luke because this is Luke's perspective on when it comes to the prophetic role of Scripture and the necessity of interpreting it faithfully. Luke is hand, you know, head and shoulders above all the other Gospel writers saying, you need to believe because the text says and a faithful reading of the text, if you faithfully read the Old Testament, if you faithfully read the New Testament, there's no way you cannot see Jesus in it. And so over and over and over again, Luke points to this for us. And this is what he's explaining to these guys. And so he pointed them to scriptures. And lastly, what does he do? He eats with them. He fellowships with them. This is the resurrected Messiah, you guys. You know, this is the one when he was seen outside the tomb, he, he told the ladies, do not cling to me, I have not yet been glorified. You know, hold on guys, something else needs to happen first. And, and here he goes in with them. He wasn't going to Emmaus, they didn't know that. He acted like he wanted to go on further, and I, I, I have to wonder sometimes, where in the world was he going? Well, in the next verses of Luke, which we're not going to get to today, he appears amongst the disciples right after these guys finish relaying this story he appears among them again but he, i want to draw your attention to a couple of things that we kind of read over but the jewish people this would have been a big deal to them when they first read this story the first thing is that jesus goes to eat with them god himself the resurrected messiah humbles himself and enters into the house of man not the temple in Jerusalem. He's outside of Jerusalem now, in the town of Emmaus. We don't know anything about this town. And he goes in, he inhabits, he tabernacles with them, just like the tabernacle that was set up by Moses. He comes in and he breaks bread. Now, what's the big deal about breaking bread? Well, the breaking of bread was the responsibility of the host. One of these two guys, whether it was Cleopas' house or whether it was the other gentleman's house, they're the ones that should have stood up and said the blessing and broken the bread. But Jesus takes that responsibility upon himself, breaks decorum, breaks tradition, and then breaks the bread, and their eyes are open. You see, Jesus is Lord of the host. He's Lord of the feast. It's one of my favorite titles of his because I love a good meal. I'll just be honest, I, I love to eat, and praise the Lord, so does Jesus. But here's the, the last thing I want you to see here, that again, we read a little bit past it, we don't really think about it, but in ancient times, there was a belief that if you saw a ghost, or if you were in the presence of a spirit like this, that you would know that it was a spirit because it would have no desire to eat or to drink, it would have no necessity. And so, all of the gospel writers that record the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus, you're going to notice that he is constantly eating. He's preparing meals. He's asking for, for a drink. He's asking to fellowship with them. He's saying, I'm not a ghost. This is not a hallucination. Give me something to eat. Do you have anything to eat here is one of the questions that he asks. And, and again, I would just, I'm going to take that liberty from now on. Anytime that I walk into a, hey, I'm Christian. My name's Charlie. Do you have anything to eat in here? Seems like a good idea. It's what Jesus did, right? So, but here's the thing. In Luke's gospel, more than any other, Jesus is found repeatedly at feasts. He's repeatedly asking people, come and eat with me. He's repeatedly saying to people, let me come to your house and eat with you. He's teaching large crowds around the meal. He breaks the bread at the feeding of the large crowd. And he does all of these things. There's a centricity to eating in Luke's gospel. 
And so he's bookending it now. He's saying, look, Jesus is the Lord of the feast. He is the Lord of hosts. He wants to fellowship with you. One of the best ways to fellowship is to have a meal with somebody. And so here we have Jesus having a meal with someone. I love how one scholar put it when he was writing. He said, the table was the place for fellowship in the ancient world. Here, family and friends gathered to share time and to share each other's days with one another. Luke has underscored the importance of meal scenes throughout his gospel. The table was a place where Jesus was heard and where his presence came across most intimately to everybody around him. This fact suggests that Jesus reveals himself in the midst of basic moments in life. Love that about him. He is at home in the midst of your everyday activity. He's not coming to you, and he's not coming to these guys. He's not saying, you know what, that's, that's beneath me. You know, I, I don't need to eat, and yeah, you know, I, I'm not even tired from that trip, you guys. I'm good. He says, no, no, let me share life with you. We've been on this journey together. Let's continue the journey into your home. You know, something as mundane as eating dinner, Jesus says, even there, I'm in your midst. And it's one of those things when Jesus makes the promise in the Great Commission, behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. What he's saying is, there's nothing that's not important to me when it comes to you. I love you that much. I want to be with you no matter what. So this is what Jesus does for us. He, he points people to Scripture. He asks them questions along the road. He walks with them. He takes the time to encounter them. And then he eats with them. But it doesn't end there, you guys. Because this isn't just a story about evangelism. This is a story about discipleship also. This is a story for you and for I. It's not just about unbelievers and people that don't yet know Jesus as Savior and don't yet res recognize the resurrection. Remember, these guys were disciples. These guys knew as much as they could possibly know in the moments that they encountered Jesus. And so I think beyond everything else, what God is trying to teach us on this story about the road to Emmaus is this, that we need to just keep walking and God will meet you on the road, you guys. No matter what you're going through, just keep walking and God's going to meet you there. I don't feel him, Pastor Charlie, trust me. He's right behind you. I don't, I don't, I don't understand, why is he not talking to me? Well, because maybe he just is waiting for you to talk it out and process it verbally yourself a little bit. That's what prayer is. He invites us. He demands us, come, speak with me. Come into my throne room. Tell me about it. The same Jesus that walked along the road is the same Jesus, the same God that comes to us every single day and says, hey, son, hey, daughter, just tell me about it. What's going on? Explain it to me. And then he meets you in the midst of it, comes in and fellowships with you. You see, so often in our world today, we we have two different categories in the church. We have this one over here that we call evangelism and witnessing. And we have this one over here that we call discipleship. And I think what Jesus is trying to teach us in this very first story of his resurrection after the women report is that these two things actually belong like this. You're constantly being evangelized. You're constantly being discipled. You're constantly having your eyes open to Jesus. Every single day of your life, whether you believe in this book or not, he's calling to you and he's saying, hey, let's have a meal together. Let's talk about this a little bit. I think when it comes to this story, what Jesus is showing us, again, in the greater context of Luke and Acts, is this is what the Holy Spirit's going to do. You see, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit would come and he would lead us into all truth, that he would teach us about righteousness, that he would remind us of all these things that Jesus said. And the disciples, they just didn't understand. And so here in Luke's gospel, we have this story of Jesus doing that, walking along, opening the scriptures, revealing truth to him that, they, that he hadn't explained when he was here walking this earth in the flesh before his crucifixion. And so when the disciples get to the moment, which we're going to cover in a couple weeks, of the ascension of Jesus, and they watch him go up into the clouds, and he's told them, wait until the Holy Spirit comes. I think that they pointed to this story and said, hey, Jesus told us what the Holy Spirit was going to do. Hey, hey, Cleopas, remember what Jesus did for you? 
I think that's what the Holy Spirit's going to do. And so when the day of Pentecost happens, Peter just surrenders. He says, speak to me, speak through me. And it's those moments that are most powerful. You see, at the end of the day, he's risen. He's risen indeed. And we point to these stories, but it's not just these stories, you guys. It's your story, and it's my story. It's the story of every person that walked into this building this morning. Wherever you are in your relationship with God, this is our story. And I, I, I'm not going to sing it, but I'm always reminded of the song, you know, this is my story, this is my song, right? Walking with Jesus all the day long. All right. Let's end like this today. Maybe you're here this morning, and you're not so sure about this Jesus thing. And I've been talking, and you're just like, man, this is, this is weird. You know, this guy rose from the dead, and he walks on the road, and he sits down and eats with people after he's come back to life. And you're thinking to yourself, I just want to know more about that. I want to ask you today, where are you at? What do you understand? How do you process this? And if you're wrestling with that this morning, I would love to, to meet you down here after service, and I'll do my best to answer as many of your questions as I can this morning. But I want you to go to the scriptures, just like we've been doing this morning, and wrestle with it. If you need a Bible, if you're here today and you don't have a Bible, or you haven't picked one up in a while, or you're saying, I can't afford one, you know what? You see that black book in the chair behind you? Take it home with you. It's yours to keep. We have more. That's how important it is to us that you get into the Word of God. So if that's you this morning, I'm going to pray for you in just a moment, and I would love to talk to you more if you have time today. But I think there's another group of people here today, and if I could have every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to ask you, Christian, who is here this morning, how's your journey going? How have you been doing on this thing that we call life, and do you need a little bit of strength today? Do you need the Savior to come up to you and say, hey, I haven't forgotten about you. Let's go in and have a meal together. And if that's you, if you could just slip your hand up real quick, I want to pray for you this morning too. That You're like, man, this life, God, I've been arguing with you. I've been having all these bad feelings. And God, I just need you to reassure me that you still know, you still see, you still want to eat. I'm going to pray with you this morning. So if you would, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for today. God, I pray that you've seen the hands that have been raised. God, you know each and every person that's here this morning, God. God, it is not by accident. God, we don't believe in coincidence that uh, they're here this morning, they're watching online, maybe they're watching this video later this week. But God, I pray that you would move in a powerful way right now. God, maybe they've been arguing with you or arguing about you to other people just like these two individuals on the road did. And God, I pray that this afternoon, you would walk up behind them, you would tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, what you talking about? Hey, son, hey, daughter, tell me about it. God, I pray that your presence would leave this place with them, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would encounter them, God. God, you would meet them where they are, but you wouldn't leave them there today. And God, for those that maybe they're here and, and they've been having a crisis of faith or they, know, they don't even know what this whole faith thing is all about, God, I pray that you would meet them where they are today, too. God, that your, your word would penetrate their hearts today, Lord Jesus. God, that you would let them start this journey with you wherever it is that life is leading them, Lord. You would say, hey, let's go for a walk. I got time for this. And God, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, hey guys, thanks so much for hanging out with us. I do have two just real quick things, uh, housekeeping-wise today, that I need to make our church body aware of. Um, the first is that uh, for the last year, we have had a secretary, her name is Bonnie, and uh, she has faithfully served us. However, she's been having some issues within her family. Her father's health is not doing so good, and so she's going to be stepping down as our church secretary here. And so I just wanted to make you guys aware of that. I know some of you guys have met Bonnie before. Um, some of you guys may not even know who Bonnie is because uh, she, she does a great job in the office, but she doesn't usually attend service. So, uh, But again, just want to make you aware of that. Please be praying for us as we search uh, for a new church secretary and as we uh, pray about who God would be leading to that position. And then the second thing I wanted to talk to you guys just real quick before we leave about, and we're going to pray about this one, is 
uh, back a couple of weeks ago, we had our annual business meeting. And some of you guys, you hung around for us, some of you didn't. But one of the things that was decided at the business meeting was that we were going to appoint a um, building committee for the renovation that we've been talking about doing to the outside of the building. We just want to give you an update on that, that we have not forgotten about it. We have our next board meeting coming up on April the 18th. And so we invite you guys, please be praying with us on who would be on this committee. We're going to be discussing it as a board. That's one of the board's responsibilities. When you guys say we would like to form a committee, the board looks at the church body and says, okay, we nominate these people to it, and we put that building committee together. But we just wanted to make you guys aware that... Um, we are so excited to see what God is going to do in our church, and we're so excited to invite you along in that journey with us. Amen? All right, so that's the only two things I got. Let's pray for these two needs this morning, and then you guys are dismissed. All right, Scott, did I forget anything? Okay, he was standing at the back door, and when he does that, it's like he's usually trying to get my attention to say, hey, don't forget. All right, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for everything you're doing here in our church body. God, thank you for the way that you are leading us here in 2024. And God, I pray right now that you would um, help us be a unified body, Lord Jesus. As we get ready to form this committee and as we move forward with this renovation project, God, I pray that you would give us wisdom as the church board, Lord. God, bring people to our minds that we may not have thought of, God, that maybe they haven't ever been on anything before, but you are raising them up for this moment, for this task, Lord God. And God, I pray that you would move on the hearts of your people, God, that maybe they have some experience in design or maybe they have some experience in, in renovation. And God, I pray that you would quicken their hearts, God, and, and, and have them to, um, again, just, just be in agreement if we should approach them, Lord, to ask them to be on this committee, that they would not even have to pray because you're already speaking to them, God. You're already in step with their Holy Spirit. And God, we pray for Bonnie and her family, God, and everything that's happening with, with her dad's health. And God, I just pray that you would strengthen her. God, that you would give her wisdom, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the time that she served our church body. And God, now we pray that you would bless her as she leaves and as she goes on to the next season of her life. And God, we just give you all the praise and all the glory. You are still good. You are still leading. You are still directing. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. All right, guys, have a great afternoon. Enjoy the weather.